the elevator raced downward, plummeting towards an unknown fate. It would be all Stanley could do to keep himself together, if not for the bucket, soothing him, comforting him, reassuring that in this darkest moment of uncertainty, he would be all right. The bucket is here for you, Stanley. Everything will be fine. Wait, Stanley said to the bucket. Can we go back up? When I was pressing those keypad buttons, there was something very intriguing about the number three. I want to go back so I can try pressing the number three again. The bucket said nothing. Here we are, said Stanley. Now I'm going to try out that number three button. He took the bucket over to the keypad and began absolutely slamming on the number three over and over and over. Well, he said, the number three is such a special button, I'm having the time of my life. Stanley looked expectantly at the bucket, but the bucket remained silent. This was a shock to Stanley, who had always felt such a connection with the bucket. How was this not as exciting to the bucket as it was to him? Once Stanley had had enough of the number three, he got back in the elevator. Perhaps the bucket had missed something. Perhaps it had not seen how much joy Stanley got from slamming the number three repeatedly. No, 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 said Stanley to the bucket. You can't go on yet. Not till you understand how much the number three means to me. You and I have been through so much together, and I just want you to see what I see. Feel the happiness I feel. He smiled at the bucket, and the bucket said nothing. Here we go, said Stanley. This time I'll really show you. He ran to the number three and began to wail on it like a musician on a beloved instrument, weaving a concerto of truth and passion. He wielded the number three like a fine artist would wield a paintbrush. He told stories through the number three, stories of his dreams and hopes and fears. And the whole time, he looked to his bucket for a reaction of some kind. Anything to let him know that the bucket appreciated what he was doing. The bucket conveyed absolutely nothing at all. Only silence. Crushed by a wave of dejection, Stanley returned to the elevator. Stanley and the bucket were so close, they'd always been there for one another. Why suddenly could the bucket not connect with this passion of Stanley's? The question caused Stanley to ruminate the whole way down the elevator. He knew that there must be a way to get through to the bucket, to communicate fully with his dear friend. Surely there was a solution, mustn't there be? I know what to do. I know how to fully express this feeling in my heart. He decided right then and there that he would hold a press conference where he would speak to the public on all matters relating to pressing the number three over and over. He would elaborate fully on what the number three meant to him and why he felt so alive when pressing it. Then the bucket would be able to see his joy through the eyes of others it would get to see the world react to this discovery of Stanley's. And it would be through the public eye that the bucket would finally understand Stanley's work. For months, he advertised and marketed his press conference, building excitement around it, developing and rehearsing it until it couldn't be refined a single measure further. When the big day arrived, 
Stanley was as prepared as he'd ever been for anything in his life. This was it. One last chance to win the bucket over. One opportunity to share a true connection with a loved one. There was no one here. Nobody had come to the press conference to hear Stanley speak, to listen to him talk about what it really means to press the number three on a keypad over and over. He was unloved, uninteresting, he was a failure. And in that moment, Stanley knew that the bucket would never again take him seriously. There would be no connection, no deeper understanding. The bucket merely sat there in his arms, indifferent. And so it began that slowly, over many years, the two of them grew more and more distant. They spoke less and less, neither wishing to state the obvious, that any sense of real respect between them had eroded since that day at the press conference. There would be no more games, no more long conversations about passion and pursuit, only a silence that consumed the space between friends. And Stanley, having for once in his life discovered the warmth and comfort of true companionship, was cast back into the unremarkable normalcy of loneliness.